Good morning, everyone. We're here once again at Ansley United Church in Markdale, Ontario. It's Sunday, May the 3rd, and uh, we're looking forward to sharing worship with you uh, once again this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Um, our secretary, Patty, is putting together a newsletter uh, for the month of May. And if you'd like to submit anything to it, uh, that would be great. Just uh, give her a call or send an email. It's now seven weeks that we have been in this time of isolation, and uh, many of us are kind of lonely and a little bit bored even of ourselves. I'm sure many of you have done more than enough puzzles and uh, have cleaned your house one too many times. So I was thinking that it's easy for us to forget that there are lots of good things uh, happening each and every day, and hopefully our worship today will Will be one of those good things that it brings us together even when we're apart and what I was thinking about was that it is like a backdrop to the rest of our week so it forms kind of the the scenery in the background of our week and can really help to ground us and and hold us and and remind us of what is true and good and beautiful so if you get that from our worship today, uh, I'll consider that we've been uh, very successful indeed. Um, it's uh, the three musketeers here again today, uh, myself, uh, Reverend John, uh, David Fries at the organ, and Tim Riley at our sound booth. And uh, we're ready to begin with our prelude. We gather in the light of Christ, we have the light of Christ within us and all around us. And so let our worship be done with the light of Christ. Amen. Now to begin, uh, we're going to learn a piece of music. It's a very simple uh, refrain and it is uh, basically uh, a Bible verse where two or three are gathered in my name. I am there. I am there. And uh, I'm going to teach it to you, and then we're going to sing it through uh, just a few times. So, uh, David, if you could give me that first note. <clears throat> it goes like this. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there. I am there. Where two I am 
are gathered in my name. I am there. I am there. Thank you. I want you to learn that because we're going to sing it for uh, a few weeks as our opening piece. Let's take a moment to pray. Thank you, God, for this day and this time we have together. Bless these moments with your presence. Bless these moments with your spirit. Open our hearts to the beauty of your essence alive in each one of us. Open our ears to the calming presence of Christ's voice alive in each one of us. In this time of worship, bless our loves, our devotion, and our hope. Bless our attention and even our inattention. Bless our open hearts and our spirits. Bless our difficulty in opening our hearts and our spirits. For we have arrived at this time and this place with the fullness of our lives, trusting that you will bless all of it. Amen. So now we're going to sing probably the most familiar hymn in all of Christendom, The Lord is My Shepherd. So for our prayer today, I'd like us to begin with a little bit of quiet. And you know, I've used my singing bowl before in church with you, and uh, I'll just let it ring. And uh, the idea is to wait for it to dissipate. Uh, and in that time, just to let your mind clear and to uh, be focused on what it is we're doing today, having worship, we're worshiping together. You can think about the people that you're worshiping with, uh, whether they're present with you or in our community. And uh, so just a bit of a quiet time before we have our prayer.
Let us listen to the sounds around us. Let us listen to the voices around us. Let us listen for joy and for laughter. Let us listen for grief and for sorrow. All these sounds are present with us, around us, and even within us. Let us listen once again for a moment. Deep within, there is another voice. It sings a song of life everlasting, a song that lifts us in our darkest moments. The song carries us from one place to another place. It bears us up as if we are on wings of a dove. Let us listen for the voice of the eternal awesome God who is wisdom, who is balance, who is calm, who is joy. Let our hearts be open to the words we hear from deep within. Let our spirits be filled with the peace which floats above the underground stream of love, which floats underneath our being and underneath our lives. Let our spirits hover there for a moment. On this day, wherever we are, whatever is happening to us now, we will listen for your spirit, O oh God. Whether we walk through death's dark veil or seek a path through a fresh green forest, your spirit rests in us. It never leaves us. May it be so. Amen. Our hymn is Breathe On Me Breath of God. For our scriptures today, the first scripture reading is Psalm 23. I'm going to read it in a contemporary version 
Most of you, many of you probably know it in the King James Version. And uh, if you want to read the King James Version after church today, of course, uh, go right ahead. And I'm sure if I said it uh, out loud, you would repeat it along with me. But this is a paraphrase that I actually wrote myself when my father was dying uh, in hospital uh, about seven years ago now. In this life, I have everything I need. I want for absolutely nothing. How can this be, you ask? I am full of calm, full of joy, full of love. In my heart, I have found quiet waters where my body can rest and my mind can stop racing. In my soul, I have found lush meadows of sweeping grass, which arrest me with their beauty and fill me with deep awareness. At every moment of every day, I am close to love, restored inwardly in my heart and soul. I am full of love eternal. I know there will be tough times ahead. I know that I may need to cross rivers of deep fear, facing illnesses I can't control or problems I can't fix. I know my journey through life will end at some point. But in this life, I have everything I need I want for absolutely nothing. In my mind's eye, a banquet of blessings fills my day. My cup is so full it runs over the top. Surely this will be so each and every day of my life. Surely I am close to love wherever I am. I am full of love eternal forever and always. And our second reading is from the Gospel of John, John chapter 10. Let me set this before you as plainly as I can, Jesus said. If a person climbs over or through the fence of a sheep pen, instead of going through the gate, you know he's up to no good, a sheep rustler. The shepherd walks right up to the gate. The gatekeeper opens the gate to him and the sheep recognize his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he gets them all out, he leads them and they follow because they are familiar with his voice. They won't follow a stranger's voice, but will scatter because they aren't used to the sound of it. I am the good shepherd I know my own sheep, and my sheep know me. In the same way, the Father knows me, and I know the Father. I put the sheep before myself, sacrificing myself if necessary. You need to know that I have other sheep in addition to those in this pen. I need to gather and bring them in too. They'll also recognize my voice. Then it will be one flock with one shepherd. This is why the Father loves me, because I freely lay down my life, and so I am free to take it again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own free will. I have the right to lay it down. I also have the right to take it up again. I receive this authority personally from my father. Here ends our readings on this, the fourth Sunday of Easter. Well, I am wondering how many of you can remember the winning movie at this year's Oscars at the Academy Awards. I'm wondering if you can remember who won the Nobel Peace Prize just last year. She's still young and very committed to the cause. 
I'm wondering if you can remember the last time the Canadian dollar fell below 70 cents American. That's kind of a trick question. All of these things and many, many others seem important at the time, but they're not memorable. I wonder if you can name the teacher that had the most impact on your life. I'm wondering if you can remember the, the day uh, your family got their first television set or the, the night they walked on the moon for the very first time or the, the assassination of JFK or the day the, the Twin Towers came down. Our memories take up space in our bodies, in our hearts, and in our minds. They take up space in our heart and in our spirit. And they, the things that we remember, are the things that we hold in our heart and our spirit, more so than in our brains. But the things that we hold inside our, our hearts are the things that have either hurt us or uh, marked us in some way or uplifted us like no other or, or maybe blessed us. And those memories held in heart and spirit hold tremendous power. They have a ton of energy, energy that lives inside of us. The person who had the most effect on me, I think, growing up was my father. I mean, he was the one who taught me how to whistle. I wish that I had known when he was alive that I should have been paying more attention to the things that he taught me. The one thing that my dad did for me more than anyone else beyond giving me gifts or money or sending me to university or the genes that he gave me or the values or even his deep faith it's very simple. Every so often, he would be at my house. He would turn to me and he would say, John, what do you think about whatever the issue was? And then he would just listen to what I had to say. And so that the legacy of my father, at least for me, is that he honored me with the gift of his attention the gift of his listening. It's the most valuable gift a kid can ever get. Now he's been gone seven years or so. Often I will find myself saying things that uh, he would always say or a movement that he would make uh, and I'll, I'll realize that I'm, I'm, I'm so like my father. I can't quite believe it. And sometimes when that happens, there's a frizzen of energy, a, a little jolt when I, I can feel his presence with me or I can feel him uh, speaking uh, to me. It reminds me of a scientific field called uh, morphic resonance, the study of morphic resonance. I know it's Sunday morning and it's the first Sunday of May and you probably don't give a care about morphic resonance. Um, Rupert Sheldrake and, and all that jazz, he was the one who studied uh, the fact that dogs know when their master is coming home. So a dog at home would know the exact moment when the master turns off their computer at the office and grabs his coat and gets ready to, to head home. Sheldrick's theory, though, is that there are planes of information or fields of information that transmit information between bodies like ours, kind of like radio waves uh, a little bit. And these planes are, are something we can be conscious of, but most of us, of course, aren't conscious of in our daily lives. Uh, on these planes or these fields of information, our brains transmit pieces of information. And then when there is a receptor on the other hand, we get what we call morphic resonance. Um, I know that's a little bit esoteric, but anyway, that's the theory. I tell you, though, that when I get the sense that my dad is present with me, even for just those fleeting seconds that it is, I swear that 
I can hear his voice, that we're communicating, even though it's not the regular kind of communication that, that we would normally have. And so there's an awareness that this brings, that there's different levels of conscious awareness. And a lot of our seeking in religion is, is trying to connect consciously with, with God or with Jesus or with other people. And uh, it sounds like a strange and unusual science. It's just that we haven't taken the time to, to pay attention to uh, our need to be consciously aware at different levels. So I was thinking about this this week because uh, there's the line in John where Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. My sheep know my voice. My sheep will know when there's a sheep rustler in the pen because the voice is different. My sheep come to the gate when I open it. My sheep trust me and follow me. And those lines just really jumped out at me, and I'm thinking to myself, what is he really talking about? Um, by the time the Gospel of John was written down um, and edited a few times, it took about 200 years or so after uh, Jesus was, was here and, and gone. What would the concept of his voice mean uh, when so many generations uh, had passed? And it does bear a little bit of our attention when we look at the Gospel of John and we see that a lot of it is written in metaphor. And so the voice, I think, is a metaphor for all that Jesus was. It's a metaphor that, that kind of evokes the presence of the Christ in times of difficulty or in times when your mind is open or in those times when your heart and your spirit is really trying to learn or to connect. And these are levels of the scriptures that are rarely plumbed because most people read a scripture and they'll just say, well, that doesn't do anything for me or, um, They'll, they'll read it and they'll think about it a little bit, but it doesn't go, it doesn't go very deep. And what I want to say today is that the story from John with the sheep and the voice is about legacy. It's all that Jesus passed down to his disciples and those memories have energy and power. Those memories of all the things that he said and did have energy and power. And if you think about it, he would not want to be forgotten. All his hard work, the sacrifice that he talks about in John, the sacrifice of his life for all these ideals and values that he fought to bring forth into the world while he was alive, all of those could very easily be buried uh, in a tomb, just like he was. All his teaching, all his modeling of a new way to live could be easily gone and forgotten. It strikes me that in our day, uh, when we think about a legacy or a legacy gift, we tend to think of only the very rich, people like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for instance. I mean, they've got gabillions, gazillions of dollars and have the ability to set up legacy funds. The rich can establish these foundations and put their names on hospital buildings, but most of the rest of us, uh, most of the rest of us don't really feel like we have much to offer in the way of legacy. I used to think it was uh, remarkable a few years ago that I could put all of my life's work, all of my sermons, all of my services, all of the workshops that I've done over the years, I could fit them all on one little USB stick and that would be 
that would be my legacy. You know, just such a, a small little uh, piece of technology. Nowadays, of course, we don't even use USB sticks anymore, and all of that information is stored euphemistically in the cloud. And I happen to think that, you know, when I'm gone, all of that information that I've stored in the cloud is really not accessible to anyone at all. It's just really kind of gone. And so it makes me wonder, will I live on, right? Like what about me will live on and provide hope or sustenance for future generations? In some uh, sectors of employment, once you retire or move to a different work facility, for, for instance, within about a month, it's as if you were never there. And so most of us seek some sort of permanence or significance or meaning. We want our lives to have had meaning. Um, a fellow by the name of John Coder, a uh, very smart PhD kind of guy, says that what we're all really seeking is what he calls generativity. Kind of a big word, also another big word for Sunday morning generativity, which is the sense of meaning that we gain by being able to pass on our values or whatever it is to, that matters to us, the sense of meaning that we gain from being able to pass that on to the next generations. But for most of us, we think kind of tangibly. We think of our real estate or our financial assets or our cars or money or whatever those things might be. And we all know those things don't last very long. But what are the things that have meaning to us that we pass on? And so when Jesus says, it's my voice, I think what he's saying is, my legacy is about me as a person, my values, my integrity, my commitment, my dedication, the ethics I lived by, all have great value. And so in trying to make those generative, right, to live on in the next few generations, he asks us, to remember his voice, to remember his voice. Now, when I say remember, I'm using a dash in between re and member. So to remember is to bring ourselves back together with him, like to uh, re-embody him somehow in our lives is a way of re Remembering him. So this is why the teaching of the church is that when we gather as the body, we are the remembered body of Christ. We come back together and, and then we do what Christ would do. This is why it's been so difficult during this COVID time because we can't be together as a physical body and it's forcing us to just think a little bit outside the box. Like what does it really mean now to, to be uh, to be remembering Jesus? And our remembering then, you see, gets us off the, the well-trod path of just looking at the historical significance of Jesus, looking at the, the Bible as a historical record of all the things that he said and done. And of course, we can spend hours, you know, picking apart scripture and the words that he said and trying to figure out what exactly he meant. But, but that's not the important thing, right? The important thing is to bring into ourselves the energy and power that he had and to let his spirit fill our spirits with that energy and love. So it sounds, I'm sure, impossible, but um, that is what the task of the Christian church is because otherwise we have no business being in business in the world if we're not going to uh, be the body of Christ. And the only way for us to be the body of Christ is to remember, that is to come back together 
inside of his spirit and with the words that he taught us uh, to try and figure out what that means in our day and time. Now, in the future, we, we might say to ourselves, you know, what are our uh, offspring and their offspring going to say about us? I don't really know what that will be for you each on an individual level. I mean, I really like the the story of Terry Fox or the story of Rick Hansen, uh, another uh, kind of similar example. Rick Hansen, you remember at the age of 15, broke his back in a car accident and then decided once he was well enough again uh, to uh, wheel his wheelchair across Canada. That turned into what they called the Man in Motion Tour, the Man in Motion Tour, when uh, 34 countries around the world and he raised over 300 million dollars I imagine he's still making a lot of a lot more money so on a personal level he's had this amazing legacy that he has uh, derived from his accident a story of adversity to triumph but let's be honest I mean most of us we just don't have that capability and uh, that's just probably not going to to happen but it doesn't mean that the gifts that we have to pass on, like my father's gift of attention, it doesn't mean that those are less valuable. It just means that we haven't taken the time to, to think about how valuable our life has been. Now, when it comes to the church, though, I'm pretty confident about what I'm going to say just now about our legacy. And that's because there's something really astonishing in this passage from John 10. And it is, uh, just to go a little bit deeper, when he says, I am the good shepherd, or in other places, he says, I am living water, or I am the resurrection and the life, or I am the bread of life. What he is saying with the use of that phrase, I am. So we just have to have a little aside for a second. Remember when Moses, 3,000 years before us, uh, Moses was out in the desert and thought he heard a voice coming out of a burning bush. And he said to the voice, tell me your name because, you know, I think you're God. I think you're the originator of, of life. And uh, the voice that came out of that bush said, I am who I am. So we have this this God who is a verb, uh, a being uh, that is a, a verb to be. And so Jesus uses these terms deliberately um, to signify something really important about how he understands who he is. He is part of the cosmic beauty of God. He's, he's not separate from it. He sees himself as being part of all that is, right? Using the verb to be, part of all that is. And so when we remember these words that Jesus gave us, then it is as if the good shepherd, in this case, the good shepherd is, to use the verb to be, the good shepherd is alive in us. Right? This is our resurrection theme, uh, that, that the power of, of life conquers death and it still lives inside of the hearts and minds of all who would follow. And so the good shepherd is in us. The good shepherd gives us the power and energy as we remember him uh, and gives us the power and energy and the hope and the leadership and the stewardship or the caretaking and the persistence and all the love that we need to be in this world as it is construed today, this very moment. And if we think about it, that is not only a huge legacy that we receive from Christ, but it's also a forward-moving one 
It gives us courage and strength to take the next steps. Could it be that the church is in danger of losing its mojo because it stopped remembering? Have we stopped remembering our story and just treating it as a a festival that happens once or twice a year, the things that uh, make up our lives uh, we don't bring to church or we don't bring to church to bring church to our lives. It's the story that we tell of the hope of the gift of life conquering death, destruction, violence, and hatred. And that story, you see, it has power and it has energy and it lives in us. And so that this means that just as Jesus said, there's that voice again, we are here to have life, life in all its fullness. That means no matter what, no matter what we are facing today, we're here to have life in all its fullness. When we remember this, remember it, it enlarges our hearts, it expands our spirits, and then we can experience a beautiful truth that here in this moment, this is life. Thanks be to God. Amen. So our hymn is Deep in Our Hearts, Deep in Our Hearts. So today, my friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.